This is why I'm a hyper, what I call hyper-Calvinist. Of course, the book of Job was written before anybody knew some kind of term hyper-Calvinism. And hyper-Calvinism, of course, is just a man-made theology. It's not perfect. It's not infallible. On my estimation, is the closest to the, the, what the scripture actually says, especially if you combine the universal salvation with it, the eschaton uh, omni-salvation, which is what my new book, Hyper-Calvinist Universal Salvation, is about, published by Wiffenstock this year. First thing, let's look at this in Job 1 here. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves to the Lord. Look, so there's a day. There's a day. So they're, uh, they're on the earth. This council, you know, and then he says here, he was on the earth, you know, here in the next verse. And the Lord saith unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear for naught? You know, in this, this concept of hyper-Calvinism, you know, where God is in absolute control and a lot of this, you know, storms where people are getting killed and, and stuff, evil, you know, God creates all that. This is what the scripture says. It's the modern churches that have changed it all around, trying to create some nice religion that makes sense to ridiculous human thinking. Human thinking equals falsehood. Genesis 6, 5, Romans 3, 4, Psalm 1, 16, 11, Psalm 118, 8, and other verses. Hast not thou made a hedge about him, Job, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. So God did it all. And the Lord taketh away, too. But look at, look how it happens. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath. And he will curse thee to thy face. So God does it. Come on now, it's what it says. And this is just going to be more pronounced when we get over to verse 16 and other places. God does the destruction. Of course he does. He's in control. He's the creator of all things. Nothing can happen apart from God. Everything that happens, happens because of God. He's omni-causal, the only cause of anything. That's called philosophical occasionalism, is the name of that theory. That is one cause of all things, and that is God. So that's, that's amazing. So God just has to touch them. So I take this very literally, of course, the touch there. Anything that God touches in that sort of direct way should crumble. Anything, any of man's structures and things he builds should be destroyed by God. So it's just like Jesus on earth was not was, was a destroyer of the ways and works of fallen man. So anyway, the Lord said unto Satan, look at Tetragrammaton. It's important that the Tetragrammaton is being used here. So I got a note here. The Lord is the Tetragrammaton in this verse, talking about specifically here about 1 verse 8. See that Tetragrammaton. So the sound of God, the true sound of God, the sound we'll hear in the afterlife. At the you know when we hear the trump of the Lord at the eschaton, awake from our graves. John five twenty five to twenty eight. Pure universalism in twenty eight. All will hear him and rise and see him. Wow! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have the truth in this scripture that God saves all men. The Lord will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The Lord is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. First seventy four ten. So Satan is talking to the the Lord in his real sound, right? Is that what that means? That the Tetragrammatons is interacting with Satan in this council. So Satan can't hear that sound or he'd be saved, right? That's an interesting issue right there. And it gets more interesting right here in verse 12. And the Lord saith unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put forth thine hands. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Satan is in the presence. How can he be in the presence? This is a mystery. He's seeing what, what you or I dream to see. Seeing God direct. Seeing him as he really is. It says in 1 John 3, 2, when we see him as he is, we'll be as we are. So you say, well, that can't be the case then. That Satan is in the presence. It says right here, he's in. The, he has to leave the presence. Now you might think, what does that mean? Pre what does it mean? Presence. It only can mean. It can't mean something like omnipresence because he can't go away from God's omnipresence. He can't. He can't go anywhere from where God is not. God is even in hell. Psalm one thirty nine verse eight. 
if you hear a rustling bag in the background, my apologies, that's my silly cat <laughs> running around with a bag here. The only way this can be is if God blocks Satan from being saved. So, so the Lord says in 1 John 3, 2, that when we see him as he is, we'll be saved, but it must not be the case for the devil. It must be the case that the devil can be in that kind of presence with the Lord, but the Lord will block the salvation, at least at this time. The only way I can make sense of that seems to uh, kind of make sense because God's, of course, who else is in, God's in control of all things. People are always saying it's the Satan. It's King James. It just says Satan. So what people are saying, oh, he's the opposer and all this. It doesn't say any of that. This is the serpent, Revelation 12. The devil, the old serpent. That's who that is right there. I had a seminary professor try to tell me once at Nazarene Theological Seminary, back before I was a hyper-Calvinist. Trying to tell me, oh, this isn't necessarily the same thing as that snake of the garden. Professor, you are incorrect. So check it out. Check it out where this goes here. You know, every, everything's destroyed all at the same time. His property, his children, and everything. But look what it says here in 16. While he was yet speaking, so these messengers keep coming and telling him, you know, all this destruction's happening. And then here's the next episode of the of destruction. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven. Does this remind you over here of, of verse 11? Put forth thine hand and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee thy face. So in this case, I mean, God is fire. If he touches, he will burn it up. Is that a correct interpretation of what's going on? I don't know, but it seems pretty safe since it says over here. I don't, I don't know. If that's, but anyway, the point here is is that it's the fire of God that did the destruction. This, see this, I, I was never caught this in Sunday school <laughs> when I was five years old. It's the fire of God fallen from heaven and he hath burned up the sheep, the servants. Look at that, look at that word. And consumed them because it's the all-consuming fire. Fire of God means it's God. It's like a little end time. If it's not God, the all-consuming fire, this is like a revealing of the Lord is what's happening here. Like at the end, that's what happens at the end of the world. God is revealed. That's why everything burns up. That's the revealing is God's fire. Anyway, that's what my whole book is about that I just published. It's all over scriptures. People don't know it. People reject and say, oh, no, it's not true because they don't read the end times. I think it's just really safe for me to sit here on a YouTube channel with almost 900 subscribers and say, what are called churches in the United States do not cover the end times. You know, people say, oh, we did. And I'm like, no, end times should be part of your everyday theology. Part of every sermon. It's a third of the Bible, so it has to always play into everything. It's the most significant event described in the Bible. If you go by quantity of pages to cover it, it would be even more in that sort of measurement. I'm not saying this is the way to think about things, but if you were to measure amount of content equaling import, how important something might be in the Lord telling us. The eschaton is number one. Clearly, hands down, nothing even compares. Which is, of course, would make sense because the whole point of everything is the eschaton. Now, I'm not a big fan of Maximus the Confessor. He definitely, he had, you know, lots of little theological errors. God has parts and stuff like, you know, saying wrong stuff. But I mean, but his theology, it, it makes sense in the sense that the whole creation is about celebration of God and that the end is coming and we're going to all be, everything's going to be restored. Acts 3, verse 21. There's other ones that say that too. God will reconcile all things to himself. So Maximus confessed, of course, that was the central theme of all his theology. Then Second Samuel 22, 31 says, the Lord's way is perfect. So of course, I can't, can't, done deal. It can't be any other way. Everything is happening is exactly as things are, should be. God is planned. So everything's perfect. Yeah, they see, that's hyper-Calvinism right there. To a T. Hyper Calvin is, is theological fatalism. We are not in control. God is, so we can just be. Well, it's kind of funny. I didn't think I'd be talking about this. We can just be like a corpse. I didn't think I'd be talking about this. So, this is a book I just happened to be reading for graduate school, Fordham, Fordham University Press. Really good book. I just started it. But it's talking about how, look at this. Take a corpse and, pl and place it where you like. You will see that. It puts up no resistance to motion, nor does it grumble about its position or complain when it is put aside. If it is propped up on a throne, it does not raise its head, but rather it looks down. If it is clothed in purple, it will look twice as pale. This is the truly obedient one. Look at that. Who does not judge why he is moved and does not care why, where he is placed. Then look down here. Blue underlining there. 
what else is the our holy bodies and these corpses capable of besides suffering? Isn't that beautiful? That's something else. This is about France of Assisi, this book, and Bonaventure. I'm getting a PhD in med medieval theology currently. As this episode demonstrates, the body in its most fundamental capacity to be moved by the external force served as a source of instruction and site of desire for the late medieval Christian devotional imagination. The pliant body of Francis's Macabre Explum is in no particular body, a nameless corpse. I have a note down here, a body is worthless. Are they being made to suffer? So a person is a corpse that God is to move and can do, we can do nothing without him. Very powerful theology. We're supposed to be like Christ, and Christ, he, part of the time was a corpse. So that's what we are. When we're Christ-like, we're a corpse. But look at this, look at this. God is in control. He's the consuming fire. So this is just, this is why I'm a, someone who believes uh, in this radical hyper-sovereignty of God where everything's perfect that he's doing. And then the hyper Calvinist universe of salvation, where he, the Lord saves all at the end. You know, you say, why does he do that? Because he has to complete his mission. All the corpses, so to speak, have to come and uh, be in the world, in the place of trials, so God can be a sacrifice. Wow, that's, uh, that's in my book, chapter 20. That's right there, the reason for everything, why we're here, why there's, we had to be a cross, why we have to be saved. It's, this is all just theology that people don't know. The true theology is not known by people. It's just taking the... All you have to do is just take this... People come to me and say, Oh, oh you know, Jeff, and nobody else does. And I'm saying, well, if if I take the scripture hyper-literally and others don't, then yes, I'm, I'll be right and others wrong. But otherwise, uh, I'm all alone here and doing this, and that's just fine. Christ had times of being alone, too, attacked by others who didn't trust the word or hear it. God bless you all, folks.